Hey, welcome everybody to our April webinar as part of the Mountain States Concrete Pipe Academy. I'm Jason Allen, the director of Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association, and I'm excited for this webinar today. It will be given by one of our member companies, uh, Geneva Pipe and Precast by Heather Christensen and Cody Mangum. Heather and I have given uh, presentations together in the past uh, in, in our webinar series, but we are excited to invite Cody Mangum with us today to, to talk about reinforced concrete pipe for trenchless installation. So we have, obviously we're part of the Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association. What is the association? Well, it's made up of a few different member companies. Wanted to introduce them now. Uh, I mentioned already before Geneva Pipe and Precast, a Northwest Pipe Company. Uh, Geneva has plants in Salt Lake, Orem, and Southern Utah, which is where Cody is based out of, is their Southern Utah plant. They're in Washington City. And also we have Old Castle Infrastructure, a CRH company. They have plants in Ogden, Idaho Falls, and up in the Nampa, Boise area. And so uh, with us on the line, we have a few people with uh, from both of those companies, obviously Heather and Cody from Geneva Pipe and Precast, and also uh, Mike Blackham, uh, the engineer from Geneva Pipe and Precast. We wanna welcome them with us today as, as uh, presenters and panelists. And also from Old Castle Infrastructure, uh, Paul Mann will be with us as well to, uh, to answer any questions if anybody has any. We also wanna recognize Ashgrove and Wholesome as two of our member companies that are our cement suppliers. So we wanna thank them for being members of the association as well. Uh, just a quick fun fact here today, as I mentioned, Cody Mangum, I gave fun facts about Heather last last month. So uh, I'm going to show you a picture here of Cody. Uh, some of you, I believe Cody's sharing his webcam with us. So you can see that this is this is the Cody I've known for five years is this beautiful, luxurious, long beard. Uh, but he, he recently trimmed it down a little bit. And so uh, but this is what Cody's beard looked like uh, for, for as long as I'd known him until he recently cut it down. So uh, there there may be, depending on time, there may be a poll question about his beard later. Uh, some things new this year that Mountain States is doing, obviously, the, the Concrete Pipe Academy. You can go to our website, mountainstates.concretepipe.org slash academy. You can sign up for upcoming webinars, and also, you can watch any past webinars on demand. So I've got those all, all uploaded. I'll have this one uploaded within about an hour of, of completing the webinar. Also, we have our Pipe It program. Heather and I spoke this morning and said, we've got to get these, these buttons out to people. Uh, now that the vaccines are, are well underway and, and we're starting to people getting back into their offices. We're going to be making some trips out to visit folks and give these buttons out so that you can uh, get your stars put on there for attending the webinars. Uh, also, our monthly project achievement profiles. We've mentioned these before, but you can get on our website at, uh, and click on the project profiles tab. We have one each month that we're highlighting. This month for April 2021, it comes to us from Old Castle Infrastructure. This is the Stansbury Park Highway 138 pedestrian underpass project. Uh, this is a, a project that goes under a very busy highway, Highway 138, that runs through Twila County. And if you notice on this picture uh, on your screen now, to the left, that's the north, uh, there's a park that connects over to Stansbury Lake, uh, which is on the southern part of this road or on the, the right-hand side of your picture there. Uh, so this is a, a fun project. It was 12 foot by 9 foot box culverts that went under the road there. And uh, pedestrians can now go from one park uh, to the lake. It's a, a very cool little thing. So if each month we're going to highlight a RCP box culvert or precast project, and then at the end of the year, we'll be giving out a project achievement award and allow uh, all you folks to vote on that. If you have a project that you would like highlighted, please feel free to send that information to me and I would love to uh, to highlight that project. So with uh, without any further ado, I would like to turn the time over to Heather and Cody so that they can uh, begin their presentation and Teach us about trenchless technologies. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Jason. I appreciate the uh, warm welcome and the, the cool picture you found of me. That was sweet. <laughs> um, so today, Heather and I will be talking about RCP trenchless technologies, a couple of uh, different types of installation that you can use with uh, RCP pipe. Um, the overview of this will be talking about uh, Micro tunneling and open face uh, shield installation. Um, going over a couple of trenchless projects. Heather will talk about some that we've done here in Utah as well as others. We'll talk about the different technology that's used to do trenchless installation. A little bit about roles and responsibilities with contractors, engineers, precasters, and at the end we'll we'll take any questions, concerns, and uh, go from there. Next, we have a poll question. So we're gonna launch this poll question. Poll question is, how many projects have you worked on that involve trenchless installation of RCP? 
So we'll give you just a few seconds there to answer that. Let us know kind of what the experience and what uh, what kind of audience we have here today. So for Please. those of you that are voting, just keep uh -huh. in mind that if you have it if you have it in full screen mode, sometimes it uh, it depending on the web browser you're using, it it won't won't allow you to vote. So if you just get out of full screen mode there on your screen, you can vote. So looks like about 80% of you voted. I'll, leave, I'll give you about five more seconds to vote and then we'll close this and share the results. Awesome. This will be interesting to see. Okay. So I'm going to share that now. So I'm not sure if you you guys can see that, Heather and Cody, but uh, looks like um, about 5% said more than 5, uh, 8 8 percent three to five 18 percent one to two and almost 70 percent 69 percent said none so we have a lot of people new to uh to trench list for you here today awesome well that's okay. really to help us kind of guide where we're gonna spend a lot of time on the presentation for those of you who have been involved with more uh than five pre five projects Keep in mind, this is a 101 presentation, so we're not going to get very in-depth in some of those technologies, but we're going to cover quite a bit in two specific technologies. Okay, so let's quick introduce a little bit about Geneva Pipe and Precast. Uh, we won't spend too much time here. Hopefully, most of you guys know us by now. So Geneva was established in 1956. This is over 60 years of experience in the precast concrete industry. We've got three facilities out in Utah. So we've got our St. George plant where Cody works at, and we've got a Salt Lake and an Orem facility. And we manufacture way more than just concrete pipe. Uh, we do manholes, catch basins, box culverts, bridge structures, basically anything that's precast concrete that gets buried under the ground is likely we manufacture it. So reach out if you have any questions on that. And we work really hard to be industry experts and become that community resource. So we do this by giving lunch and learns and presentations and plant tours. And, you know, we attend a lot of conferences and events and we offer design services as well. So we've got Mike Blackham on the line. If you ever have a tricky design question that maybe involves something that you're not used to with precast concrete, uh, reach out to him. I'm sure he's dealt with it numerous times by, the, by now. So we're always happy to help in that, that, that fashion. So like Jason said, we've recently become part of Northwest Pipe Company. So that makes us actually an international company. So we've got scattered facilities across the United States and then one, one facility actually in Mexico. So that little floating dot down there isn't a mistake, um, but the precast concrete side of the business is here centrally located in Utah. So that's, that's kind of our, our locations across the states. And I'll hand the time over to Cody to talk about a case study. Perfect. So we thought we'd start out by talking about a little bit of our experience in one of the projects that we were heavily involved with. This project is still actually ongoing right now. It's called the Venice Dual Force Main Project down in LA. Um, it's, it's a unique project. It's got a lot of complexities to it. It's basically a pressurized sewer main. It's a 54 inch diameter. It's about 10 and a half thousand feet, so 10,400 feet going from the pumping plant all the way to the treatment plant. It goes you know, up to 30 foot below the ground surface and below the water table. In this case, it's sea level. You can see the ocean right there. It's literally right on the frontage area to Venice Beach. Um, below some dense developments, it actually goes under Marina del Rey. That's the entrance right there to Marina del Rey you can see on your screen. Um, they had to avoid a lot of existing utilities in that older part of town. There's a lot of existing utility conflicts that they had to work around and it also has some curvature in the alignment it has both a horizontal and a vertical curve in the alignment there it'll show you a little bit in this illustration here about how they went under the marina it's kind of an illustration of what they did they have a receiving shaft on one side and a launch shaft on the other they have 10 total construction shafts on the project with a maximum drive length of about 1,800 feet. There's a couple of different type of materials they used on the project. They have about 8,600 feet of uh, reinforced concrete cylinder pipe and about 1,710 feet of our RCP jacking pipe, which we used on the project. On this slide, you can, you can see the illustration on the right, which shows our portion of the project was highlighted in, highlighted in yellow. It's a 72 inch diameter casing pipe, 1,710 feet in a single drive. It's, it's driven the, the whole drive from one location. Um, 
up to 25 foot below the ground surface and up to 15 feet below the water table. So on the plan view there, you can see it has a horizontal curve to it. Here's a screenshot from the actual plans. The launch shaft there on the left and the receiving location right there on the right, right by the uh, treatment plant. A total of about a 1200 foot radius in that location. You can kind of see on the right hand side of your screen. On the next slide, you can see the vertical curvature. So you can see it actually changes elevation quite a bit. It has about a 3,500 foot radius in this location, going from a lower low elevation up to the upper elevation at the, at the treatment plant. So this, again, it's a 54 inch pressurized sewer main. So they, they elected in this location to do a casing pipe and sleeve it with a pressurized 54 inch sewer pipe. So real quick, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse on the on my end on the screen, but I'm showing you right here on the plans where that water lip where that water table is on that project. So it's it's pretty unique how um, they can tunnel underneath the water and still achieve a vertical and horizontal curve. Yeah, that was definitely one of the unique challenges about this project for sure. So we used a uh, single single gasket, single O-ring gasket on this joint. You can see the guy in this picture here, you know, applying the lube to the to the spigot of the pipe, getting it ready to go go down in the hole and be installed. Uh, lubrication is important to help it seal to keep it in its in its home in its groove. It worked really good. Hamilton Kent uh, was a supplier of this and did a really good job with uh, helping design a, a good joint for for this endeavor. On the next slide, it illustrates a little bit of kind of the job site and, and the uh, launch pit. So you can see on the left there, they've got one of the pipes, it's rigged up, it's going down in the hole. They put it in spigot first. And down on the, on the right hand side, you can see the actual launch shaft there. They have about three or four guys in there all the time. They've got, uh, you know, their jacking machine, which is, which is pushing that pipe in. They're monitoring a lot of things. They've, they've got the slurry lines coming in and out that you can see attached to the machine, which there's a lot of uh, internal piping in there that goes in to connect the machine as well, which we'll go over a little bit later. Let's uh, move on here. So now Heather's gonna talk a little bit about some of our Utah projects that we've done. Yeah, so that project, the Venice Dual Force Main was a really cool project because we think it encapsulates kind of all of the features. Um, and design capabilities or uh, technology capabilities for microtunneling and, and trenchless, uh, which are ever expanding. I mean, the industry is growing really fast, a lot of innovative methods to, to tunnel pipe and culverts underneath the ground. Um, but because this is a Mountain States Concrete Pipe Association uh, presentation, we wanted to focus a, key, a little bit more on Utah projects and what we're used to seeing here. The majority of the projects we've done here in Utah um, are focused on, on tunneling under I-15. So they're really straight, short, short segments of pipe, maybe 400 to 300 to 400 linear feet. Uh, we've done one in Centerville for a stormwater project. This one's in Vegas, Project Neon. I'm sure you guys have heard about that one. That one's a really big project, um, but I've included it because it's just a couple hours out of our St. George facility. And then um, St. George, we've done one there, and, and Lehigh. So all of these have just been short drives, just straight right underneath I-15, uh, where it makes a lot more sense rather than digging a trench and diverting traffic on such a busy highway, tunneling becomes a really good um, application for us there. So we'll dive in a little bit more on the different trenches technologies. Um, I'd like to talk first about the definition of trenchless uh, technologies and kind of the benefits associated with the applications over, overall. Um, the definition that we've got from North American Society of Trenchless Technologies or NASTT states that it is a family of methods, materials and equipment capable of being used for the installation of new or replacement of rehabilitation of existing underground infrastructure with minimal disruption to surface traffic businesses and other activities. So essentially there, you can kind of see the benefits are in and of the name, right? So it's going to reduce impacts to society and traffic, um, reduce the, the impacts for road repairs and disruption to the residents. 
And it's also going to enhance safety in a lot of ways because, you know, we're taking all those guys that would be required in an open trench out and allowing just one or two guys in a, in a drive shaft um, that can operate the equipment. And in some cases, just operate the equipment from ground level. Um, so it can help a lot with the safety concerns in certain projects. And it reduces environmental impacts as well. So there's a lot of benefits associated with trenches technologies. And we'll talk about some of the benefits associated with each type of technology we're going to discuss today. Um, but there's a whole bit, bunch of different types of technologies. And we'll let kind of Cody talk about some of these. Um, and then we'll dive deeper into two specific ones. Thanks, Heather. So yeah, there's there's a lot of options out there when it comes to trenchless, trenchless technologies, but we'll focus on a couple of them. But just to mention some of the others, you know, you've got horizontal directional drilling, uh, pipe bursting or pipe ramming and pipe ramming, auger boring, pilot tube, vacuum method. But what we're going to talk about today is the open shield pipe jacking, micro tunneling, and we'll briefly mention uh, EPB or earth pressure balance tunneling. So that's that's basically your options there. Um, you know, it's it's a good creative process to brainstorm with some of the people in the industry to see which method is best for you. So also we want to talk about benefits of RCP and trenchless, because obviously we're concrete pipe producers. So um, one of the big benefits of concrete is built to last. It has a hundred year design life. Um, it has a long life expectancy. It's a sustainable product made from renewable materials it's adaptable and customizable you know you can use it for a variety of different things you you have the option now of having some corrosion resistant uh, applications and products out there with an HDPE line pipe uh, it can be used as a casing or a carrier pipe you can use it for direct uh, flow of of influent sewer or storm drain or whatever or it can be a carrier pipe for other things we've seen it used in other locations for electrical. So we've, we've done some where it's a casing pipe for electrical conduits in certain locations. Design and construction flexibility. You know, reach out to us, talk to us, talk to contractors that install it and see what availability and what options they have to meet the needs of your project. Maybe they have a good, good way of, of doing something that's efficient and cost efficient for your project. Robust structure. It is a structure. We're putting a structure in the ground with the pipe. It's designed to meet the loads. It's designed to meet the jacking forces. It's it's designed to do its job when you put RCP in the ground. And quality control, it's a prefabricated product. It's made in, in our plant where we have quality control methods that ensure that when it shows up on site, it's met, it meets all the standards and design requirements of your project. So with that, we're going to go a little bit into the open shield pipe jacking, and this is where Heather's going to take off. Awesome. Thanks, Cody. So like we said, there's a whole bunch of different methods of trenchless technologies, but there's a few specific ones that apply specifically to RCP. And so that's why we're going to delve a little bit deeper into open shield pipe jacking and micro tunneling. And then there's also earth pressure balance or EPP, EPB jacking, which we don't have a lot of time to go very in-depth into that but if we get to the end of the presentation and we've got six or seven more minutes left over we'll come back and we'll watch this little video on epb um jacking and that will kind of give you an idea it's very similar to micro tunneling though so let's get right into it and talk about open shield pipe jacking so what is open shield pipe jacking um, essentially, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's got an open shield at the front of the tunneling equipment. And so how it works is it's excavating. Um, soil is ingested with a excavator bit. And so these excavator bits can look different based on what types of soil you're, so your soils you're working with. Um, in this diagram at the top, the excavator bit is indicated at number one. And so how it works is it, that excavator bit is, is shining kind of out through the open face of that tunneling equipment. And from there, it is uh, removing the soil, excavating the soils, and that soil drops down. From there, it's going to be collected on a conveyor belt. It'll take a little short trip on that conveyor belt over to a muck bucket or a so soil removal bucket. Um, which is basically just a little locomotive that's going to take that soil once it's full, it will take the soil and bring it out to the uh, launch pit. 
And then from there, they'll just use, you know, their, their equipment to lift that bucket out and remove that soil and then send it back in so that it hangs out and waits for additional soil to be excavated and, and filled in. Um, one distinct difference between open shield pipe jacking and micro tunneling that I'd like to point out is that you, it does require an operator at the face of the equipment. Um, you can kind of see that here in the schematic below. Uh, you can see the guy, you can only see his arm and, and um, shoulder, you can't really see his head, but ultimately you have someone in the tunnel operating the, the equipment at all times. And so some of the benefits with that is that they can kind of see the soil and react with the equipment and the digging strategy um, as they need to. Uh, it is guided through a laser. And so the laser is mounted to allow them to see where they're going and if they're in alignment. And it's articulated with steering control. So basically anywhere after three. So on this diagram here, where it's indicated number three, it's a steering cylinder. So essentially that the steering or the shield and the excavator are articulated. So that allows them to adjust the, uh, the position of all of those so that they can steer the equipment as they move forward. So just like all the different types of tunneling technologies, the open shield technology has a, a number of different shield types that they can use based on what soils they have on site or what the geotechnical report indicated. Um, so here on the left, you can see a couple different ones that are more like window blinds, right? So these are often called kind of sand shelves or louvers, and those are used in tech in applications where you're working with maybe less stable sands or soils that might have a little bit of flowability with them. And so how it works is you can actually open and close those shields as needs be, um, or in certain portions while you're excavating other portions. So that helps a lot with unstable or less stable soil conditions. And then these three pictures on the right are rotary. Um, so those are more representative of like auger bore type style. So essentially how that works is they've got different cutting bits on the front and that just rotates. And as it rotates, our soil drops down, it's collected by the conveyor belt and removed through the soils bucket. Um, here's the excavator bit. So this little yellow image here, or this little yellow uh, equipment here, that's their little excavator bit that's going through and digging the, the soils out as they go. So the application specific for open shield pipe jacking are, um, it basically it works for a number of different utilities. So it could be sewer, it could be water, it could be electrical, uh, it could be a casing pipe for electrical conduits like Cody was talking about. Um, but really, the main focus is that it's going to be large diameter crossings. And the main reason as to why it's larger diameter is because you have that operator in, inside the equipment as it's going. And so anything below a certain diameter makes it really a tight fit for anyone to sit inside there and operate. Um, so we'll kind of talk about the limitations with that as well. Uh, you'll, you'll want to have mostly stable soil types. Some cobbles and boulders are okay, um, but essentially if, if you have stable soil, that's gonna be the best because you don't want any chance for soils to be flowing in rapidly during that open face. Um, so cohesive soils, things like that is gonna be important for this type of application for open shield jacking. And ultimately you don't really want groundwater. Ideally you'd want the groundwater to be below the invert of the pipe in this application. Uh, in some cases, I've heard that groundwater could be above the invert if the soils are a uh, very low permeability. Um, but if the soils have high permeability, then that allows, and the groundwater is above the invert, then that will essentially allow that soils to be flowing in um, to that open face. And that can be a potentially dangerous situation. So really the key is that you'd probably want little to no groundwater and applications for open shield. Some of the limitations. So again, groundwater inflow control. If you have very permeable soils and the groundwater is slightly above the invert, that can be okay because you can handle it just with some pumping equipment. Um, but again, you really don't want a lot of groundwater and, and seepage into that open shield. Face stabilization. So um, you're going to want to make sure that, again, those soils are going to have to be stable enough that they're not going to be flowing in. 
And if you do, if you are working in areas where you have flowable soils or uh, loose sands and silts or clays, things like that can introduce the chance of overexcavation, which could ultimately lead to settlement on that project. So there's some limitations there. Uh, in terms of diameter, the typical diameter range, and so this doesn't mean that they've there there hasn't been smaller in some cases or larger in other cases, but generally the the typical diameter range for open shield pipe jacking is 48 inches to 120 inch diameter. Um, you can go bigger, and you can actually use different types of uh, boxes like you could do box culvert. I think that we've done a project in the past at Geneva with an open shield box culvert jacking. Um, you could do elliptical as long as the equipment was out there and you could uh, utilize that. So as long as the diameter is sufficient enough for that operator to be in there and controlling the equipment, then you should be good to go. Typical drive length for open shield pipe jacking is anywhere less than a thousand feet. And we'll kind of talk about why there's that limitation there for the drive length in, in, the, in the coming slides. But ultimately it has a lot to do with that excavator um, soil removal bucket. So that muck bucket going back and forth. The longer the drive, the longer that travel time for that, that soil bucket. And so um, it becomes very wildly inefficient uh, soil removal as the, long, the drive length gets longer. Accuracy, I mean, you can be pretty accurate with open shield, but once we get to the microtunneling section of this presentation, you're going to see that the accuracy for open shield is just a little bit less. Uh, you can achieve up to two or three inches to the um, accuracy that you were looking for for the alignment, whereas micro microtunneling, I think it's a little bit less than that. So ground conditions, uh, there's favorable ground conditions. We've touched briefly on this, but essentially what you're looking for on a project is a geotechnical report that comes back and says that you've got stable, cohesive soils. So rocks and cobbles are okay in some cases. Um, really, it depends on the size that you're working with. Cobbles can be okay, and, and that's another difference between microtunneling and, um, and open shield pipe tracking is that our cobbles are better, better handled with with open shield pipe jacking. So you can remove them easier because you've got an open face. And rocks, you can handle rocks as long as the rock in diameter is you know, smaller and achieve, it can be pulled through that open face. Then it's a little bit easier to handle soils that have rocks and cobbles and then some of the other applications that are out there. Again, groundwater, we've talked about that. You, the goal is to have it below the invert. But if you're working in a scenario where you've got very permeable soils, you might be able to get away with the groundwater being slightly above the invert, but just know that there will be some limitations to that and some issues. Unfavorable ground conditions is basically the exact opposite. So if you have unstable soil, something that's like soft clay or flowing, flowing sands, that's gonna be really difficult to manage in this type of application. And groundwater above the invert. Uh, we've kind of talked about that already. Oils removal. So what do you do with all that sand and soil as you're pulling it out? Um, so like I said before, you can see a photo here on the left hand side where you've got the operator. That's kind of where their, their setup is. So you can see right off the bat, it would be very difficult if you were working in a pipe diameter that's smaller than 48 inches um, because that, that space becomes very tight for that operator to be in. And sometimes these projects can take a long time and, and you don't wanna have someone just cramped in there the whole time. So this is more ideal and more suitable for large diameter trenchless installations. But essentially you can see there on that left-hand side, that photo where that black hole at the back, that's the open face. That's where the soil is gonna be excavated. It's gonna drop to the ground and then it's gonna take a short trip on that uh, conveyor belt. And then from there, that conveyor belt will drop it into your muck bucket. The muck bucket will then travel through the drive length. So the number of pipes that you've already installed and they'd remove that muck bucket and empty it and send it back right on that little locomotive pathway right over so that it can be filled up again. Required work area. Um, ultimately, the work area for the launch pit, so you, so you have a larger work area required for the launch pit in almost all trenchless applications, because that's where you're storing the pipe, that's where you've got, you know, if depending on the type of um, 
the type of trenchless application you're using, you might have a separations plant, you, you have somewhere to store all the soils removed, things like that. But for open shield pipe jacking, it's a little bit less of a work area size than for microtunneling. So you're working with about 10,000 square feet and you basically need room to have a crane or excavator to lift equipment and lower equipment into the, uh, into the drive shaft. And then you'll have generators for power supply, spoil, spoil storage, so where you're gonna be putting the soil that's removed and pipe storage. Um, ultimately, you're probably not gonna get 1,800 feet of pipe just hanging out on the job site. Um, you can work with a manufacturer to ship the pipe at um, a certain rate so that you can install it at that same rate as well. But you do need some area for storage of that pipe. And then also for whatever trucks and equipment that you still have. Um, reception shack, you're working with about 5,000 square feet, so a little bit smaller, but essentially you just need a crane for lifting your equipment out as it's been tunneled through, so that, um, that ton the, the open shield face, essentially. And uh, you'll need some room for truck access for removing that equipment. So talking about things that you need to think about during the installation process is because you have an operator required at the face to just have that in mind um, understand the conditions that they're going to be facing down there that can be there can be some limitations with that and like i was mentioning before you can have inefficient soil removal once that drive gets longer so if you have that a very long drive length the trouble is is that your excavation your removal of the soils is the same rate, right? You're you're still digging out the soils. It's getting conveyed into that bucket at the same rate, but the drive time for that muck bucket is going getting longer each pipe you install. And so as that drive length gets longer, that bucket usually there's only room for one bucket, especially in those 48 inch diameter um, applications or or sizing. Then you have you know one muck bucket but once you get past that you might be able to get a chance for two muck buckets depending on the diameter but even then the longer length that's really going to be the um the indicator of what um basically what's holding you up on the project and so it becomes very inefficient for long drive lengths which is why we'd say that a, an average drive length of about a thousand feet is is probably maximum for open shield pipe jacking some of the advantages is that you have, you can visualize that excavation. So the operator can adapt their drilling um, as needed based on the soil conditions. So that can be a really good perk for this application. And you have face access. So this makes it easier for removing objects like your rocks, cobble. So that's another advantage for this one. You have a, a various, um, there's a lot of different shield types out there depending on the soils and you don't have to have a separation plant required. So what that means is, and Cody will talk about this more when we're going over the microtunneling section, but with microtunneling, you're pumping in some um, liquids to kind of help, help remove the soils. And so afterward, you want to send that through a separation plant to clean them out and uh, separate that. So with open shield pipe tracking, you don't need that because you're not introducing any liquids in, in the um, excavation process. And relatively, it's a smaller work area than microtunneling is. So we'll we'll kind of talk about how that is different here in the next couple of slides. I'll let Cody talk about microtunneling. Sweet, I'm back. Can everybody see me? We can see ya. All right, that's a good looking load of pipe there. I like that. Um, real quick, just to touch on Heather's topic about the uh, open open shield tunneling. You know it people have a variety of equipment i was involved with a project here in southern utah where we tunneled under i-15 with a 54 inch diameter pipe and they they actually did it by hand they didn't have an excavator arm in there they had an open shield and they had about three or four guys in there with picks and shovels uh, chiseling away at that so i mean it can be done in very rudimentary methods or you know advanced technology so it's it's interesting to see the variety of but they got it done. It took them a little bit longer, I think, but uh, they did get it done. It was interesting to see. Yeah, Cody, so, that's a really good point that I forgot to mention on the advantages of Open Shield is that ultimately the equipment you're utilizing is less expensive as well. And so um, that could be another advantage that you know I forgot to mention. Yeah, I want to say this one was only just over a couple hundred feet. So 
you know, they were able to take advantage of some cost savings using labor rather than, you know, high end equipment and, and made it work. So, okay, moving on, what is micro tunneling? Let's move to that next slide if you can, Heather. Sweet. So what is micro tunneling? Um, don't be confused with the word micro. It is not meaning small typically defines a method, not a size. So there's vast size ranges that can be used in micro tunneling, any for anywhere from you know 24 inch on up to very large diameters. It is a remote controlled operation. So there's there's nobody in there manually operating this equipment. They're in a remote, remote controlled office or job site trailer, you know, utilizing the laser guidance system or cameras to do, do so. Um, so it is a laser guided system and typically it's you know most of the time it's used in a, in a pipe jacking method whether that's using steel concrete or other various materials it is it is a typical pipe jacking method meaning you, you put one pipe in and push it in and then add another pipe and keep going that that direction so we'll talk about the different systems here on the next slide of extraction so you can see there's a couple of illustrations here on the left there is a conveyor spoils extraction system. This is typically used in the, in the larger diameter micro tunneling. Um, this illustration shows, you can see a person in there, he is not operating the cutter head or anything like that. He is actually there operating the installation of the segmented tunnel pieces. This is actually a segmented, segmented tunnel illustration here where they're, they're using segmented segments to create the tunnel rather than whole cylinder pipes. So you have the, the cutter head on the left, uh, you have a screw conveyor conveying all the spoils back to a conveyor system, the thrust cylinder pushing it forward, and then the, uh, the gripper shoe that's grabbing, it's grabbing each of those uh, tunnel segments and placing them in place. On the right is typically what you're gonna see in a standard RCP micro tunneling installation. You have your cutting head still on the left there, you have um, various pumps and valves in there that's it's pumping in pumping in liquids and liquefying that soil and bringing it back out you have hydraulic motors you have an articulated joint as well that's how they accomplish the the different uh, curves when when they have curves similar to like what we mentioned on the venice dual force main horizontal and vertical so there's a, there's a lot of equipment in there. Occasionally a guy may go in there to check on the equipment, but while it's in operation, there, there's no one in there actually operating that equipment. So applications, we'll move on to the application slide. We can talk a little bit about that. Gravity sewer, pressurized sewer, as mentioned in the Venice Dual Force Main, they're actually using the RCP as a, a casing pipe to put their carrier pipe in for a pressurized sewer project can be used in gravity sewer applications as well. Uh, typically one of the most, most common installations we see it for is storm water. Um, it is favorable in high groundwater conditions because you have a sealed face on that cutting side of the micro tunneling machine. The groundwater is not gonna infiltrate into the tunnel. So as long as you have a good sealed unit and they actually have to seal it back at the launch shaft too to keep it from yeah, filling up their pit with water. As long as everything's sealed off, it, it's a good solution for a high groundwater condition. Unstable soils, it's not as big of an issue because uh, everything's encapsulated. Uh, they can keep pressure on the face and keep those stable, those soils as stable as possible. You know, if you have any overhead obstructions, any type of, um, you know, trenchless technology is obviously good in that situation. As mentioned before, it can be used as a casing or a conduit for all types of utilities. It can be used from stormwater, sewer, um, also for, like we've seen, electrical and other things. I haven't seen anything yet that's used uh, multiple utilities or communications or anything like that, but I think that's, uh, if it's designed correctly, it could be done that way. There is a few limitations with the micro tunneling versus the open shielded can only excavate objects up to, you know, a quarter, a third of the size of the diameter of the micro tunneling uh, machine. Uh, if you have a high percentage of gravel and cobbles or boulders, boulders that can obstruct the micro tunneling machine, basically that's, we'll show an illustration of that here in a little bit. But uh, if you have a lot of cobbles and gravel, it, it can cause some problems with your pumping system. 
It does require a little bit larger of a work area and storage location because of some of the additional equipment required. And, uh, you know, spoils with high liquid contents can be a challenging for disposal. If you're in an area where it's hard to dispose of uh, liquefied soil, it can be a little bit of a challenge. Typically, you see it used in diameters anywhere from 24 inch to 96 inch. Doesn't mean it can't be larger as I sh showed that illustration of the uh, segment of tunnel machine on the previous slide. As Heather mentioned, it's typically used in longer drives, 1,500 feet or more. You know, it just depends on, on what application is the most efficient for, for the project that you're working on. With this system, you do not have the muck carts traveling back and forth. You, you typically have a, a hydraulic system removing those spoils. Accuracy, it's, it's highly accurate. They have laser guidance systems that are on there. They're continuously monitored from a remote location and installation is typically very accurate. You know, one, two inches when you get down to the final drive within your proposed alignment, it's, it's a pretty good system to be used. So ground conditions, some of the favorable ones for a microtunneling system, loose to dense sands are, are favorable, soft to hard clays. It changes up a little bit on the speed of how you tunnel with, with the clay soils. Soft rock is okay, high groundwater, it's great because of the sealed system. Some of the ones that can cause you a little bit of issues are cobbles and boulders, flowing gravel, very hard rock, or if you have mixed face conditions. We have a slide coming up, I think that's uh, the next slide on mixed face conditions. You can see how the illustration here, it shows the, the bottom right hand corner is kind of illustrating kind of a harder rock with, with maybe some unstable soils or silty soils on the top. If you go in there, it, you, you get slow where you're coring into you know, the hard stuff and the, the soft or silty soils at the top can kind of start flowing in as you see the illustration on the right and possibly cause sinkholes or, or other problems. Um, the next slide also illustrates a little bit of kind of the process. Okay. As well. Go ahead. Real quick on that, um, what I did learn is that if, if they run into this type of problem in the field, what um, something that can help is if they change the rotation direction of their cutting head. That can help uh, eliminate some of that settlement issue um, in that different mixed face conditions scenario, just to point so that out. It can out. be mitigated a little bit by, by the contractor and his, his construction methods. Oh, okay. So on the left here, we've got uh, just kind of an animated image showing, you know, the cutting face doing its thing. You've got the, the clean slurry coming in through the top line and the spoils coming out through the bottom line and it's going up and it'll go through a separation plant and separate those spoils from the slurry and then uh, recycle itself. On the right, you can see what kind of problems are caused a little bit by, uh, you know, a bunch of cobbles or small rocks. This is actually a valve on on the uh, slurry system where it's been plugged up with a bunch of cobble so if it gets gets too dense in there it can it can pack it in tight and cause a little bit of problems between the pumping and the valving system on those so this next this next illustration it shows various different types of cutting heads these are all sealed heads um, basically you know when the, when the contractor sees what type of soils he's working with he's going to work with his manufacturer of this equipment to find out what what equipment's going to work best for this application. You've got different types of cutting wheels as well as cutting teeth, uh, water water injection ships systems to help liquefy that soil and extract it using their slurry system. Quite a quite a number of different things that we've seen over the years used. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the required work area. As Heather mentioned. There is more equipment involved in this type of installation. You're gonna need a little bit more room, the launch pit. On average, they're gonna recommend, you know, about 12,500 square feet, approximately. It varies on the, on the size and the equipment that you have. But you're gonna need operation room for a crane, the separation plant, the control cabin, generators, spoil storage, pipe storage, and truck access. On the bottom left there, you can kind of see all the different equipment. They actually have two cranes shown in this illustration. One is just to get their, their tunnel boring machine in the, in the launch shaft because the smaller crane was, was too big to handle that kind of weight. Once they get that 
tunnel boring machine in the, in the in the hole there that that big crane's going to move out of the way but the smaller crane will actually handle handle the pipe and installation of the pipe but you have a separation plant over on the left kind of by the loader you have a, a truck that's there he's going to back under that separation plant to haul off the spoils you have a, a lubrication pumping system that's there generators uh, slurry pump systems and, and various other storage items on the job so you can see how it kind of can get a little bit packed in there tight and, and need need a decent amount of room for all your equipment the reception shafts a little bit different you don't need near as much equipment basically you need to have enough room to be able to remove your your tunnel boring machine once the drive is done and truck access to get them in there and also to get a crane in there to get it get it pulled out so some of the advantages safety wise there is no routine personnel entry required basically it's it's remote controlled so you don't have to have people in there with within a confined space and monitoring air densities and oxygen levels and and such like that it's also suitable for most ground conditions and groundwater it's it's a good good application for those situations any trenchless method is going to have a minimal impact to traffic and roadways and at most of the time depending on your situation if you have a high traffic area it's going to be more cost effective than open cutting if you have to divert traffic or reroute traffic and, and open a very high density road casing pipes can house more than one utility in some instances so it can be you know a good solution if you're trying to get more than one utility across across a roadway and, and they can be housed in the same same pipe and as long as the proper design and data is given to all the bidding contractors and designers and, and suppliers you know it can mitigate that risk quite a bit the better information they have at bid time is is going to help them so that kind of covers the differences a little bit in the the two the trenches technologies that Heather and I are talking about. Let's talk a little bit about some of the similarities. Um, some of the similarities are listed here in this table below. You can see open shield pipe jacking right there. It typically has a diameter range of about four foot up to 10 foot. But uh, the limitation there is really on, on operator room, as Heather mentioned earlier. Typically, it's, it's an efficient method for anything under a thousand feet. Accuracy, you know two to three inches in, in your alignment there, as opposed to the micro tunneling is a little bit more accurate. It's a little bit more fine tuned uh, installation and the, the differences in ground ground conditions. So stable soils, you know, it can handle a little bit of cobbles and boulders in the open shield versus uh, groundwater is, is a big concern for the open shield and flowing soils. Whereas micro tunneling, it is suitable for uh, groundwater and flowing soils but on the, on the downside you have you know extensive cobbles and boulders and gravels that can cause you some problems yeah and i i want to point out epb i don't think we're going to have time to discuss it today or watch that video we're, we're, we're going to be short on time at this presentation but you can tell that it's very similar to micro tunneling it's basically achieving the same task with the same conditions but it achieves it in just slightly different way and so if you're interested in learning more about that you know we can always schedule a presentation we could talk you know full hour on one of these individual types of technologies and so we won't have time to cover that today but at least you'll have an understanding that it's very similar to micro tunneling good thanks heather we're going to kind of go through these next ones a little bit quickly just because we're short on time um, obviously, to push the push the pipe through the ground, it's, it's got to have a lubrication system. Typically, they they're going to pump bentonite in there around the exterior of the pipe, around the annular space uh, between the exterior of the pipe and the soil. That's going to be achieved through a pumping system. They're going to have injection ports. We we cast injection ports in the pipe that allows them to do that and keep that pipe moving. One of the one of the big things that helps on the longer micro tunneling runs, and we've also used them on open shield, is intermediate jacking stations so it can be used on you know pipes 36 inch and larger it allows you to do longer drives um, and basically the way the way the system works you can see the illustration there in the bottom left that's a good illustration uh, it allows you to to basically isolate sections of the pipe 
you put these I, IJS or any media jacking stations in in certain sections of the pipe and it allows you to say push the first third of the pipe forward reducing the uh, the jacking forces required and then initially you know follow that segmentally back and, and move the middle third of the section of pipe and and the back third of the pipe so those help mitigate the jacking forces are, that are required, and we are able to make pipes that can accommodate that, so they can they can go on those longer runs without without issue. So roles and responsibilities. Here's just a really quick thing. This was a, this is a fun picture to take. Heather, Heather yeah. was part of this. So this is down on the Venice Dual Force Main. I'm a little bit scared of heights. They put uh, me and another guy along with one of the contractor employees up there. They got us up, I don't know how high it was. It was probably 80 feet, 100 feet. I don't know. It seemed a like forever. A thousand feet is what it a felt like. A thousand feet as far as I can <laughs> The cable on the crane kind of moved over on the roll and it dropped us like an inch and I almost peed a little. It was, it was scary. Yeah, but that it, was, it was really cool though to be up there on the beach, man. We got the coolest, um, you know, aerial view of everything and the whole whole view of the beach. Man, it got windy though. Like the ground level, no wind, and you get up there, I felt like it was 20 miles an hour wind. So that it was, was an experience, that's for sure. <laughs> that's awesome. So, okay, awesome. So thank you so much, Cody. Now we're going to talk about the roles and responsibilities of the various players of the game, right? So who's involved in the project and who, what do, what are they doing on the, on the project? So for the owner or the engineer, um, ultimately, their role is the design, obviously. So they need to be defining what the pipe hydraulics are, designing it to be um, hydraulically capable to handle that project, the slopes, the alignment of the pipe, um, and geotechnical information. So this is so critical on these types of projects is geotechnical information and having a very, very in-depth geotechnical report because a lot of the application in that technology depends on the geotechnical um, information supplied to the contractor. Uh, they'll also be required to give proper specifications on the pipe and things like that. And we'll kind of, I'll cover just briefly real quick, different specifications that you can review or different resources that you can review for trenches types of projects. Um, but one thing I do want to point out for the engineer and owner is to avoid over specifying uh, when it comes to means and methods. So if you if there is some requirements for right of way that's going to dictate where that launch and retrieval pit location are great, make that uh, available and, and give that information in the plans. But try your best not to say, hey, this is exactly where we want that launch and retrieval pit, if at all possible, because really the contractor is should be in charge of their means and methods for installation and a lot of times you'd be surprised at what types of capabilities they have so if you go through and set you know 10 launch and retrieval pits they might be able to reduce that down to six or eight depending on their application and, and the the method that they're using to install i mentioned real quick i was going to show you some of the resources if you want to ask any questions on these specifically feel feel free to do so um, but a, a lot of this has a lot of information. Really, ASCE 27 is for microtunneling pipe or jacking pipe. Um, if it's C76, I mean, you can specify that, but the standard for microtunneling is ASCE 27. So everybody's got a role and responsibility in a, in a project like this. As a pipe manufacturer, our job is to design the pipe per the specifications and loading requirements and also the jacking forces. Um, we manufacture it per the specs. You know, we have we want some guidance on handling and installation. We're gonna give that to the contractor, make sure it's handled and installed correctly. You know, if gaskets and different things are not installed correctly in a microtunnel situation, near below groundwater, it can cause some issues. And we're, we're here to, you know, make sure you get a quality product. We have in-house quality control, quality assurance, making sure that all those all those specifications are met. It's, me it's measured, it's within tolerance, and it's and it's gonna go on the ground, you know, without an issue. On the contractor side of things, they also have to follow the specifications and determine the, the means and methods that they're gonna use and share that with us at bid time so we know what type of application they're gonna use, what type of pipe or joint is gonna work best for them. 
you know, co coordinate the project and management, you know, time management, materials management. They have to be safe out there. They have to install this all safely. And ultimately, you know, installation is, is their requirement. The better communication between all parties involved, the better a project's gonna go. So, absolutely. No, no question, here we go. So we go over this, it's kind of a trick question here. Who's in charge of calculating the jacking forces? What do you guys think? If Jason, you can launch that poll question for everyone to start voting. Here's where the Jeopardy music comes on. Jason, yeah. Jeopardy music. Yeah. You, you want me to hum it? Is that what you want? <laughs> so keep in mind, jacking forces time. are different than the forces that the pipe can handle, right? So there's there's the jacking forces in which the pipe is going to experience based on the method of installation, but then there's also the forces that the pipe can handle. So kind of two separate things that are connected in a way. We'll, we'll leave it open for a few more seconds here. We've had about two uh, two thirds of the people have voted here, so. Uh, make sure you vote. We'll go about 10 more seconds. All right. We'll close it and share those results. Uh, looks like 13% said engineer and owner, 23% pipe manufacturer, 26% contractor, 38% all of the above. I love it. Okay, that's a great response because, you know, one of the red flags for at least a pipe manufacturer is in when we are working on a project and, you know, we are asked to be giving a bid for a, a pipe that's going to be installed and the contractor says, hey, tell us what the jacking forces are going to be. Well, in a lot of cases, that's dictated by the method of their installation. And so ultimately, the engineer and owner, the pipe manufacturer, and the contractor should all be capable of calculating those jacking forces um, in their own, own methods. And each party should have you know, communication and be able to do that. But really the contractor needs to supply uh, those calculations based on the method of installation. The engineer should also be doing that as well. Um, and the pipe manufacturer, I mean, if we're asked to do it, for sure we're gonna do it, but but really it depends quite heavily on the way that they're installing, how much bentonite they're gonna be using during that installation process. Um, all sorts of things IGS like that. stations, you know, I mean, that, that affects it quite a bit as well. Yeah, so everyone should have that level of responsibility to know what those, will, those might look like, but it, it's heavily dependent on what method of installation they're utilizing. And that brings us to kind of that point, that ending um, point that Cody was making is that communication is so important on these projects. Uh, we need to be discussing the specifications for that pipe. What's going to be best for that application? That owner needs, that owner and engineer needs to be able to accurately um, tell the geotechnical conditions on that job. And you know, the pipe manufacturer needs to be talking to the contractor on where they want those lube ports and what their equipment looks like and how you know, the outer diameter is going to work for their equipment. And the contractor needs to be able to talk to you know, the owner and engineer in all sorts of cases. And so communication will, between all parties is going to help these projects be successful um, and as least risk as possible. So in conclusion to our presentation, there's a lot of benefits associated with trenchless installations. Uh, we kind of covered them at the beginning, but let's go over them again. So they enhance the safety of the project, meaning you're pulling most of the people that are installing out of that, that area. Of course, you do have your operator in an open shield um, tunnel method. Uh, but ultimately, the amount of people that are in a trench or having to work directly lowering that pipe in, an, in the ground is going to be much less. Uh, you're going to reduce impacts on society and environment and traffic. Um, you're going to reduce the amount of road repairs that you have to work on because you're not having to disturb the soil above. And disruption to residents and environment is, is reduced quite a bit. Uh, the benefits when using RCP in trenchless is, Cody talked about them earlier, but ultimately RCP is it's robust. It's built to last, right? It's got a hundred year design life. It's sustainable, utilizing sustainable materials that are all recyclable. You can be crushed down and used again adaptable and customizable we can offer corrosion resistant options we can be have allow the pipe to be used as a casing or a carrier pipe and it can have a little bit of design and construction flexibility 
Um, if the joint needs to be adjusted for any case, I mean, we can we can always work with the contractor on stuff like that. It's got a robust, robust structure and it's designed to meet the loads of the project, um, not the installation loads. I mean, essentially you can rely on the, the pipe design to meet the loads and what's gonna be experiencing in the field. And like Cody mentioned multiple times already is the quality control because it's, it's manufactured in a controlled environment at our plant. Um, we are gonna be able to make sure that you know the environment is optimal to make the best product for you that's going to be delivered to the job site ready to go so we are exactly on the hour um we have a couple questions i don't know if, if we want to start going through those and if those of you who need to get off early great you're welcome to jump off and and if those of you are able to stick around um we'll kind of go through some of those questions absolutely so the questions that we got heather there's two of them here if you have if anybody else has questions, feel free to type them in now as we're going through these, and uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, one is about uh, failure. So if there is a failure, does it occur in the tunneling process? Uh, that's the, the first part to the question. Where does the failure typically occur if there is a failure? Um, is it? Are we talking about a pipe failure? Is that what you're referring to? I that's a great question. I, I wonder if it's if it if it doesn't work, if it if it uh you know if you've got the the if there's any failure overall, does is it the is it the tunneling issue? Would it be soil issue? Would it be the pipe that fails? Where where do we typically see any failure in a in a micro tunneling? Right. You know, I've um, I've got a little bit of experience with contractors on failures. Um I've 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 talked with them about a couple of different ones. One was an equipment failure. Their equipment, you know, went down. They were they're almost to the end of the drive, and and the, the the face of the machine broke. Something something on the face beyond that sealed portion broke. Unfortunately, yeah. it was in a situation where it was it was not retrievable where they're at. So they they're actually going to have to open up another shaft to dig down and get it. It is remediable, but it it is a costly costly remedy. Um, the other situation is if you do have a pipe break or a problem with the pipe itself. Um, we've we've seen that happen or heard about that happening. Uh, typically, if it's if it's still jackable, sometimes if it's not too too far towards the rear of the jack, they can just keep pushing and push it out and cycle that pipe out and recycle those pipe and keep putting them putting them back in. Um, those are my couple of experiences, Heather. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, you know, um, another another thing we've heard about on projects is the geotechnical, like the soils maybe were unexpected. And so the the important part of knowing the geotechnical report and understanding what soils are going to come in, come across on the job is that it really depends on what cutting head you're going to be utilizing. Um, so over excavation can be a failure where there's more settlement than was anticipated, maybe a sinkhole is created on a job. So, I mean, that failure is a pretty broad term, but there's a lot of different ways that these projects could go south um, if that communication factor is kind of thrown out the window or, you know, if not all the information is provided. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, a second part to that question, is it possible to do this with box culvert or only pipe? It's certainly possible to do it with box culvert. Um, again, we had talked about a project that Geneva has done in the past where they had that open face excavation and, and really it was just guys in there utilizing some excavation equipment to um, slowly remove and then push that through. So it, it's reasonable to do it with box culvert or even elliptical pipe in cases as long as you can find the suitable equipment to work for that, for that installation method. Perfect. Cody, I don't know if um, you have yeah, no, you're good. You covered it. Okay, say you're crossing under I-15. How many geotechnical soil borings is are warranted to determine the soil condition? So, typically, how many how many borings are we going to need if we're going under something like a a heavy traffic in a, a major major highway like uh, I-15? That's a really good question. Um, so ultimately, under I-15, that's probably about a 400 foot passage or crossing. And likely, depending on where you're at under I-15, if it's a, a built-up area, maybe it's um, like kind of an embankment situation where that soil was already built up to allow for I-15 um, roadway slopes and stuff, 
you might not have to do too many, maybe two, um, but if it's in an area where you're unsure and you want to have the most um, optimal installation, you might go with three, but you know, Mike Blackham, I mean, all of you guys are on the line too. So if you have a differing opinion, uh, let me know. I know in yeah. talking with some guys on this, you know, typically on those shorter runs, they'd use an open face type installation where that isn't as favorable for you know collapsible soils and different things like that if they if they have a if you have a thought or a, a issue thinking that soils types may change as you get across then more is obviously better but you want to you know you want to save costs on your on your design so it just kind of depends on you know you take one on either side and and see see how it looks or you know that's that's where I think you get a contractor involved in the design process and ask them their opinion too. Build that communication, for sure. And I think to build on to what Cody just said, I think it if you take two two boring logs and they're completely different from each other, then you're going to have a lot more concern, and you might need to to do multiple more. But if you take a couple different locations and they're essentially identical soils for the most part. Um, then, then you might feel comfortable knowing that that's probably what's what's on the entire job. Interesting. So, as far as design life, I mean, typically we we talked in our previous presentations, like the one we did on um, in January, was about concrete pipe fundamentals, and we talked about a 100-year design life. Does this does this process uh, change that at all? The design life is it? Um, are we still looking at a 100-year design life cycle for these pipes, uh, or does this process change it either shorter or longer? You know, that's a really good question. I, in my opinion, I don't think, if anything, the microtunnel application is going to allow for a longer design life because, actually, I have a diagram here, which I really like. Let me see if I can go to it. Um, because ultimately your work, you're not really disturbing any of the soil. And so um, the loading on, on the pipe is really just what you're working with and what you've calculated. And so if anything, it might allow for an extended design life. Um, again, we've got other people on the line that may have something else to say on that, but there's a lot of benefits with trenchless installation because you're not disturbing that native material, which allows for you know, it's it's staying compacted. You're not going to have issues with you know different different um, different pressures as it begins to settle or anything like that, which is a really big benefit with trenchless insulation. So I guess I guess to kind of rephrase the question and then and then your answer. It sounds like it sounds like um the because you're designing for these extreme compressive forces to get it through uh, these these applications here. Um, the forces that you're seeing from the loading up above wouldn't wouldn't impact it adversely any any more adversely than it would with a standard open trench installation. So um, you're you're not going to this this process of of pushing it through and putting it in this severe compression isn't going to diminish the life of the of the concrete pipe. It's it if anything it, it would stay the same at a hundred year design life. Is that kind of the your feeling? Maybe Mike, I don't know. You're the structural engineer on the line. What are you? Is that accurate? A lot of times when you go through the um, jacking pipe calculations, um, you actually don't have the soil and vertical loading that you would as if it was a um, trench installation because those soils have already, you know, done their thing. They've settled. They've they're they're starting to get that bridging action. They're so so you don't get the loadings that you normally would if you had an open cut, um, compacted fill type installation. Um, with that being said, a lot of times it'll be called out just to use class five pipe just because it makes everybody feel good because it's a jacked pipe. So you're yeah. you're buying a pipe that's much, much um, stronger and overkill of what you normally would do, even though the loads aren't there. And then kind yeah. of as a last comment, we all know concrete is very, very strong in compression. Um, and it doesn't, you know, the cracking doesn't come from compression. It comes more from the tension forces. So right. compression is not a big thing with concrete. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Um, do you know if these methods are approved by the Union Pacific Railroad for crossing under railroad tracks? We've crossed under railroad tracks in a lot of our projects. Um, I would imagine they are, but I can't say yes or no because I'm not familiar with their requirements unless someone else on the line is familiar. I know we've, we've went under railroads in a lot of cases. 
Yeah, as far as I know, it's allowed. I, I've known many jobs that go under railroads. Yeah, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a case by case basis that you would have to. I don't know that they have a. I don't know that there's a standard for it um, for Union Pacific or for any of the railroads to, that have like a standard that you have to follow. But um, I think it's a case by case that they have approved this type of um, trenchless installation under a railroad. But I'm guessing case by case is my understanding. Ultimately, um, installing under a railroad. I mean, this is probably one of the more effective methods to install rather than digging that trench and disrupting the railroad. I mean, really, that's why that's where most of our projects, it's big big um, highway crossings or railroads or under waterways, things like that, where you don't really have a lot of other options. Mm -hmm. That's where these projects become. I want to popular. say that box culvert that was a uh, trenchless installation was under a railway, yes. if I remember right. Yep. Yep, and we did some modifications to that box culvert to make it very specific for that that um, that project. So that's okay. another again the benefit of of concrete is that we are able to you know adapt it to the needs of the job. Excellent. So why is ASCE twenty seven preferred over ASTM C seventy six? Good question. So ASCE or ASTM C76 is just your standard RCP uh, manufacturing requirements and so it's per um, indirect design and so that's that's beneficial for open trench installations for most cases. When you get into ASCE 27, Mike, you might be able to comment a little bit more on this, but essentially it's going to talk very specifically about microtunneling applications and microtunneling pipe. Um, so it might require a direct design where you go through and, and verify that all of the forces in that project are going to allow for, you know, maybe you end up with a more strict design or a more um, conservative design than you would with a class five. But ultimately, in a lot of cases, like Mike was just describing, you do, you can move forward with a class five, but you do want to double check some of those forces and make sure that you're going to get away with that. But Mike, maybe you want to comment a little bit more on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll add just really quick. So C, ASTM C76 is more of a manufacturing specification and it's the designs in C76 are based on all your vertical loads, you know, your class one, two, three, four, five pipe and the requirements. And that's everything you have to do in the manufacturing facility. Um, ASCE 27 is more of a design specification and it's very, very specific to um, trenchless pipe. So it start in implementing some of those um, horizontal loads rather than those vertical loads that you're experiencing with open trench installs. And then lastly, what is the minimum cover depth uh, the microtunneling can be used? Mm, I think this is going to be different per contractor and what the equipment they're using. But I mean, for projects, Cody, you, you might be able to comment more, but uh, they're in terms of projects we've done, some of those I-15 projects were as shallow as you know, cover over top of the pipe four feet. So uh, the shallower you get, the more difficult or um, I would say the risk increases when you get too shallow. Yeah. Not that the pipe yeah. can't handle it, but the construction method may be yeah. a little bit challenging for it. Typically, you know, I mean, we have done them like Heather said, a little bit shallower, but typically the ones we see are, are pretty deep. You know, typically, you know, ten feet or more. Not to say it couldn't be done shallower, but you need to you probably ought to talk with some contractors and stuff and see if the equipment allows or the what the risk factor is going to be when you get too shallow. Right. Well, Make sure you have an experienced contractor. I think the other big concern, Jason, would just be making sure that whatever above you is going to be stable. And you know, if you have a roadway right above you and you go a couple feet underneath it, there's a good chance you might you might mess up the roadway and and get some you know have problem in your roadway so it also have to go back to the geotechnical engineers on on what kind of soils are provided yep. sure. okay. yeah the shallowest again we did i think it was nick's nick's construction who installed and i was really impressed with talking to stephanie nix about it she says that that was one of the shallower installs they'd done and it was four feet or something above the top of the pipe under i-15 so you know, definitely talk to contractors before, and that probably would be a question more applicable to a contractor, absolutely. Well, perfect. Well, those are all the uh, the comments and questions we had. I wanna obviously give a very special thank you to Heather and Cody for the uh, the great presentation that you all did. We, we definitely appreciate you and 
and taking the time to share that with us. Interesting stuff. Uh, we're grateful to have you in our association and, and this uh, this technical expertise. We, we, we're we definitely happy about that. Um, Mike, thank you as well for being on the line and, and answering any questions. And uh, and Paul Mann from Oldcastle, thank you as well for, for being there. So uh, we we will have this available later this afternoon so that you can watch it on demand and you can uh, rewatch it if you have any questions, but feel free to reach out to uh, Heather. Heather's uh, information is still on the screen there. You can reach out to her if you have any specific questions about this this presentation or this topic. Uh, but thank you again, Heather and Cody. We appreciate you. Thank you. And again, you can reach out to Cody for sure as well. I don't know why we didn't get this slide adjusted because um, we were co-presenting. Okay. So please, me. information was at the beginning. Probably reach out to him before me on anything. Uh, this was probably just a mistake in our, our presentation building. <laughs> So, well, thanks, thank everyone. Thank you very much, everybody. We definitely appreciate it, and we'll uh, we'll we'll catch everybody next month, hopefully, when we have another uh, presentation from our cement folks. So, we'll uh, we'll see you all see you all next month. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you.